So I wanted to create a puzzle app that allowed me to take any stamp, uh, similar to in the real world, we have uh, metal stamps that actually punch out puzzles on cardboard designs or uh, metal designs. And so I wanted to be, be able to take any digital image or any digital stamp and punch it out onto any other digital image of my own and generate actual puzzle pieces from it in a, a very quick and easy way. And so what this allows me to do is it allows me to take any image I want in this system and punch out puzzle pieces. It also lets me to very quickly actually draw puzzle pieces that I would want. It is, this seems relatively intuitive in my opinion. Uh, but the way that this works is actually pretty cool and it uses multiple threads as well as, con uh, as, well as coroutines. And it's something that I wanna share with you because I think that uh, there's a lot of miscommunication with how coroutines work and how uh, multi-threading works in Unity and I wanna kind of demystify that a little bit. So the first thing's first, um, Unity single threaded. So anything that happens on the Unity main thread can only be accessed from that Unity main thread. And what, what I mean by that is if I wanna check a game object's components, I wanna call get component on something, that can only happen on the main thread. If I wanna see a transforms uh, game object, that can only happen on the main thread. If I want to get the pixels for a texture, again, only main thread. Anything that would happen uh, as a Unity method, a Unity process that could happen within the execution order of a nor uh, normal Unity uh, application, has to happen on that main single thread. And so this causes kind of a problem if you want to multi-thread things because that parallel process, that, that uh, extra thread you spin up, can't touch that main thread of Unity. And so you run into problems like, okay, well, what's the point of having a parallel process? There are technically ways where you could have everything happen on the single main thread, but the, the risk you run there is if you have a really complex process that's really math intensive or takes a long time to run, you either need to set up coroutines with a ton of yield return nulls or yield returns or a, a very complicated process to return power back to the player or give a progress report and it gets kind of convoluted and it just doesn't make as much sense and then on top of that uh, there are already a lot of asynchronous methods and processes that unity uh, leverages itself to call say for example web services or other things that happen in the back end of unity that are literally just multiple uh, threads happening in the background and then they're, they're just asynchronous. They're returning control back to the player and when it's done, it'll go ahead and continue its process. But the important thing to note is it is possible to multi-thread in Unity, but it's kind of complicated. So there's three golden rules I've kind of come up with with multiple threads. The first one is the thread cannot run any Unity logic or methods. That means you can't instantiate objects from the multiple threads. You can't call get component. You can't even get the transform of a game object from a parallel thread. You can only run that on the main Unity thread. Uh, a good way to kind of think about this is you should only pass and receive data directly from a, uh, a secondary thread or a third thread or tertiary, whatever you want to call it. Uh, a second rule of thumb is the thread needs to be handled by a mono behavior. I'll show you what I mean by that. So I have this puzzle stamp as a mono behavior and it's creating a thread, my threaded puzzle stamp. And it's handling this in the sense that it's creating it, it's running it, and if this mono behavior were to be destroyed, it's also aborting the thread. This is critically important because if you don't exclusively do this, when you run a parallel thread and you start it up from one of these scripts, Unity doesn't know it exists unless you tell Unity that it needs to keep track of it. Because the problem you run into is if I were to start this process right now, and I'm gonna just show you what I, I mean, if I were to start this process and stop it midway through, this parallel process, this second thread that I spun up, has no idea that the program has stopped and it's gonna continue running. For something short and sweet like this that runs really quickly, you know, a couple seconds of the thread running before it tires itself out, not the end of the world. The problem you run into though, is if you don't catch this and this is something that's calling out to a ton of web services or running a really, really complicated process, you could run into runaway threads that are consuming memory or crashing, or you have an infinite while loop because it's dependent on something from your program. This is important because this mono behavior now exclusively owns this thread. And so if I were to cancel, I were to close my program, it was a crash, this mono behavior to be destroyed, that thread goes with it. And I don't run the risk of these runaway threads or memory leaks or anything like that. Um, and the third one is that data can only pass between threads and the main uh, Unity thread uh, via either concurrency safe, like thread safe objects or uh, thread safe collections, meaning a concurrent queue, 
a concurrent dictionary, or just sta uh, standard objects. But you cannot use a standard queue, you can't use a list. I guess you could, but I, I very much advise you to not because you can run into contention, you can run into issues with multiple things fighting for access to that list, and you run into a lot of really complicated processes. Uh, this is one of the things that makes networking super complicated, is contention. If you have multiple processes running in parallel to one another, how do you synchronize those? And so uh, the most common way to handle that is using concurrent uh, collections or thread safe collections. So let's just get right into it. Uh, now that you've kind of gotten a little bit of my soapbox here, let's show you what I mean or, or how I leverage this um, multi-threading in UD to handle my problem. Um, I have this puzzle stamp. What it does is it applies this, this image over this image and it generates a bunch of little pieces, right? And it does it very, very quickly. Um, but it's really not that complicated a process. Uh, all it does is on this image, it looks through, let's just treat these big squares as pixels. So let's say we start on this image in the bottom left corner and we found, oh, there's no, there's no color on this. I should actually drag and drop this so it's, it matches that statement a little bit better. <laughs> so I start in this bottom left corner and I find, oh, okay, there's no color in this square. Move on to the next one, move on to the next one. And I go all the way up to like here. Okay, I found a square that has a pixel of white in it. This pixel now has been identified as, hey, that's something that we should actually consider copying data over of our main image into a new piece, right? Um, I wanna stamp this color out. And so the way that the flood fill works, it says, okay, I found color here. This is a part of the piece we wanna stamp out. Now let's look at the neighbors. Okay, this is also white. Okay, this is also part of it. Okay, this is also white, also part of it. Oh, we found green. This one is not a part of our piece. And it does this to all of the neighbors of each one of these one at a time until it runs out of neighbors or it's completely gone through every single pixel in the entire image and it's done. And what this allows us to do is allows us to completely grab every single pixel and blit that image from our, our source image into a blank canvas so we can generate textures from it later on or we can generate those individual piece textures or sprites. Um, but the reason why we wanna do that is because it's easy for me to work with, uh, I could, it's very easy for me to draw these puzzle pieces. It's very easy for me to stamp these out and make it a dynamic puzzle piece. Um, but let's just get back into our code here. So what I do here is, right now I'm just calling this from the start method. You can call this coroutine from outside of this uh, entire class. I'm calling it from the start method so that it runs when I press start. You don't have to do that, but I do, uh, just because it's easy for demos. Um, but in the coroutine I take in two textures. I take in the stamped texture and the image's texture. And immediately upon entering that coroutine, I convert these textures, which are technically Unity objects that have methods on them. They're not actually a strict data type. I convert them to a strict data type, uh, a color array, which is color as a struct. So that's strictly data. And so what this allows me to do is I now have converted my stamp texture into pure data. And I've converted my image texture into pure data. Okay, all the data I need to, in order to do this, this puzzle stamp, flood fill and blitting shenanigans, I have as raw data. So now I can create a thread, pass that information to it, and I can do all this in a parallel process because I don't care about whether or not I'm in Unity now because all of this is just data processing. Um, and important to note, I had mentioned earlier that you need to make sure you use a thread safe collection. I'm using a concurrent queue. This concurrent queue allows me to pass data from my parallel process thread back to my main thread right here or my coroutine here. Uh, if I don't do this, Sure, this process could still run, but how am I going to pass the data back? It's it's not going to happen. So this is something that's really important. Another thing to note is queues, um, and I believe dictionaries and lists, as well as a couple others, are passed by reference. So I pass if I pass piece queue into this method, it's not going to pass the full queue itself as a value. It will actually pass the the memory element, the reference itself, back in. So I can actually directly affect something on a different um, thread. From, one, uh, from a different one. So I can actually call and change values on the main thread from my parallel process thread, even though they're technically not supposed to be able to do that. Well, they are supposed to be able to do that because that's how, but anyways, I'm not really explaining this well, but I want to continue. Uh, and then I immediately start that thread. So let's actually get into the, well, let's finish talking about this first before we get into the puzzle stamp that's threaded. So what I do is then I continually monitor that queue to see if there's any piece data that's showed up. And if there is any piece data, I instantiate an object from it I configure it and I customize it, and then I continually wait for that queue. 
If the thread is still running, I keep checking that queue to see if there's any new piece data in it. Once the thread is done running, once it's done doing its thing and, and running through the whole process, all right, cool. This thing is gonna end too. The coroutine ends, the thread ends, and we're good. Um, but let's get into threaded puzzle stamp because this is where I think it's actually kind of nifty and it's also really complicated. So at the very beginning, we call the constructor to instantiate this thread. What this does is it sets the uh, color arrays to some local variables, it defines the width and height, it defines the pixels per unit, and it also gives the reference to the piece queue so I can pass data back up to the other thread. And it also creates a new thread that's uh, gonna call this method stamp. So we've, we've constructed it, we're ready to go. Once run is called, it just starts the thread and it goes through this process. So something important to note, you might be asking, hey, I called get pixels to get a color array. This is one dimensions. This is a one dimensional array. Pixels typically are two dimensions, they're an X and Y. Yes, they are an X and Y dimension. However, you can uh, convert a two dimensional array into a one dimensional array and have the same exact amount of data and as long as you know the width of that image, you can convert that one-dimensional array back to two dimensions. And so um, the way that this get pixels works is actually pretty simple. Um, if I wanna convert the color array back to X and Y position, here's the equations. Uh, the, the modulo of the pixel number uh, by the width of the image will get you the X position, and the integer division or the floor division of the pixel divided by the width is going to be your Y position. Um, Something that's important to note, I could convert these directly to X and Y positions each time and convert them back and forth. I personally really like the way that arrays work and I like to just keep everything as an array rather than convert it to another structure. So I, I just leave it as is and I, I've i worked with this enough that I happen to know it off the top of my head and I don't need to do the conversion. But for your help, this is so that you can understand that we haven't lost any data. We still know the X and Y position of each pixel even though it's been obfuscated as a one dimensional array. So we get into the stamp method and we start it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And initially we wanna create a hash set for processed pixels. This is important because as you saw earlier, if I started in this pixel right here and I identified uh, this is something that I should uh, flood fill from, I check my, the, the neighbors of it. I say, hey, here's one that I found. Let's check the neighbors. Okay, here's one that I found. If I continue to check the neighbors, I'm gonna go back to the pixel I just started on. So I go up, down, left, and right. Okay, well, found two of them that are also white, so I do, let's start from this one, up, down, left, and right. Okay, well, one down, I found, I'm literally gonna repeat the same pixels over and over again. I'm never gonna get out, I'm gonna have an infinite loop. Uh, the reason I have this processed uh, hash set here is to track which pixels we've already looked at or we've already processed, and so that we can have that exit condition. Without using this, we would never exit this. This would be an infinite loop, and we'd have a runaway thread that would have to, we'd have to shut our computer down, and we'd cry, or it would just be a miserable time. <laughs> but uh, then just some standard initializations, uh, defining some values there, not a big deal. But once we get there, we know, okay, we have a whole image, we have a whole array of a bunch of colors, we wanna iterate through every single pixel. And anytime we find a pixel that's not clear, so we go through one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 six, seven, eight, oh, we found one that's not clear, we wanna flood fill that pixel, or we wanna flood fill that piece. So you found a pixel that's not clear, let's flood fill all of this and cut out this piece as a new image and as a new, uh, a new element so we can generate that game object. So here we're gonna go through every single pixel one at a time on that one dimensional array. And we're first gonna say, have we already processed this pixel? No, okay, let's continue on to the rest of this. But if we have already processed it, we're gonna still increment the pixel, but we're gonna skip the rest of this logic. This if statement is probably a little bit strange to some of you newbies in um, C Sharp or Unity. Uh, this if statement functions very similarly to me just putting everything in a massive if construct. Uh, however, it's typically not a good idea to nest a ton of if statements. If you have something that's an exit condition for the loop or something that says, hey, skip to the next iteration, it's probably a better solution to just put the if statement at the beginning and then do a continue statement afterwards because otherwise it's kind of janky. But um, we first check to see that the pixel is processed. If it's not processed, then we check to see that the pixel is not transparent. So up here I define my ignore color as clear. Uh, if it clears alpha value, the reason I'm checking the alpha value and not the whole color is because some, uh, actually all your, edit, your photo or image editing softwares don't save transparent as the same color. Sometimes you can choose that transparent color, sometimes you can't. But the, re the reason I say that is there's four elements to a color. There's R, G, B, and A. 
RGB can be anything, but they're going to display the same if A is zero on any computer because A is the transparency element or it's the alpha element. Um, and so sometimes I can save something with 1110 and it'll look the same as 0000. Unity's color.clear is 0000. And so I just say, let's just check the alpha element. That's all I really care about. And so if it's not transparent, we'll continue on to the rest of the while loop. If it is transparent, we're going to skip it and continue to the next iteration. But here's where the magic is. We've identified a pixel that's not transparent, and we've identified that that pixel has also not been processed yet. So, hey, we found a new piece. Let's flood fill it and let's blit it over to a new data uh, or a new, a new canvas, and let's actually enqueue that piece data over so we can have our main thread generate it, the object and instantiate it and customize it and everything else. So here's where the flood fill piece comes in. What we do is, uh, I'm not gonna get too much into the, the weeds here. This is really a standard flood fill with a little extra elements where we're actually tracking the um, width of the piece as well. But it's a standard flood fill that's a, a stack-based flood fill. It's not a recursive one. And we go through them, and as we flood fill, we blit the elements from one, uh, from the source image, or the image of my dog in this example, onto a blank canvas. We're not just filling the stamp, we're actually taking that stamp and using it as a mask to blit a different image onto a blank canvas. And so we, what we go through is we check to see if the current pixel, if it should be blitted, if it should be, then we need to check its neighbors. So what this means is when we enter this flood fill piece, we have an initial pixel value. We have that initial pixel value, we add it to our checkables. Those checkables, we iterate through them. And if we find any other neighbors that are also the same color as it, we add it to that checkable stack and we keep iterating through those until we run out of things to check and we run out of neighbors that are valid. And as we keep going through the stack, we blit them over to this canvas and um, we continue to track a couple of things. Uh, and once we're done, we've identified all the pixels, we've, we've, cut, we've blitted all of the pixels from our source image over to this empty canvas. We wanna go ahead and copy that empty canvas into a smaller array. This is not necessary. I do it because it reduces the memory footprint of the, um, of the uh, what am I talking about here? It reduces the memory footprint of the actual method. Otherwise, what would end up happening is if every single time I create a new piece, I have to create a whole canvas of the exact same size as the original image. Uh, if I have a thousand pieces, I'm gonna multiply the memory footprint by a thousand, uh, which is probably gonna blow your RAM out of the water. So what I try to do here is I actually reduce the amount of memory that each of these pieces would consume from an, uh, an actual byte standpoint by reducing the size of the texture 2D or the color array to the absolute minimum that it would need to be to have a whole rectangle around it. Uh, it's It makes more sense if you just read through the code yourself, but basically what I do is I grab the width and the height of the piece and I actually generate a smaller color array and I copy one row at a time from the big empty canvas. I just copy the relevant uh, rows uh, one line vertically at a time into that smaller array that I just created. And then once all that's done, I can then enqueue my new piece data with the piece colors that I've now identified and blitted over to the canvas, uh, the height, the width, um, and then the minimum max and minimum wide identified starting points, as well as pixel per unit and piece numbers. And all this stuff essentially gets enqueued and pushed back to the queue right here so that when this concurrent or when this coroutine runs in parallel with it, it can pick that data up off of that queue and actually generate that uh, element. I hope this wasn't too convoluted. This is essentially one pass through. I apologize if I ramble a bit, but I hope this is helpful. I'm gonna share the code if you'd like. Uh, you can go take a look or check out the code yourself. I'm just gonna share a link to my GitHub. I'll create a release or a, a branch with this on it and reference it directly so you can take a look yourself. Uh, but thanks for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. You can leave a comment or you can shoot me a message as well. Um, there's, there's not really, I see you later. This is awful. I feel bad leaving it. I'm just gonna end it. See you later.